there's always hope. There's always hope. And that's what we're hanging on to. I'm sure that's what the family's hanging on to, but we'd like to get closure for the family. Someone in the public is the one that's going to help us with this. We know that. We're just waiting for that one person to come forward, and we encourage them to do so as soon as they can. That was Captain Vern Thomas with some words about hope something that could be really hard to hold on to for a family that's been searching for their lost loved one for three years as of today. It was St. Patrick's Day back in 2020, right on the verge of the world changing forever due to the start of the COVID pandemic that Amanda was last seen. Some might wonder if that could have affected the early investigation of this case or the fact that the people she was with didn't contact anyone to let them know she had gone missing for a few days and that she left important items behind, including her cash, her purse, and her cell phone. Either way, we are here three years later saying, it's time to turn on the searchlight for Amanda Grzewski. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do. And I don't mean that lightly. A lot of the cases we cover here have components that many people, including some people in mainstream media, would shy away from. Drug abuse and sex work are part of Amanda's story, but that's not even close to a complete picture of who this young woman is and the importance she has in this world to her family, her friends, and especially her young daughter, Madeline. According to Wikipedia, Derry is a town in Rockingham County, New Hampshire, United States. The population was over 34,000 people as of the 2020 census. Although it is a town and not a city, Derry is the most populous community in Rockingham County and the fourth most populous in the state. The town's nickname, Space Town, derives from the fact that Derry is the birthplace of Alan Shepard, the first astronaut from the United States in space. Derry was also for a time the home of the poet Robert Frost and his family. You'll see several buildings and streets in the area that honor the popular poet. Amanda is one of six siblings. On the Vanished Podcasts episode about this case, which I will attempt not to retread, but to make today's video more of a companion piece to Marissa's excellent work, Amanda's mother, Jessica, details her early years, speaking of an animated child with a dry sense of humor who had a knack for learning things with little to no outside help. That streak of independence would seemingly be both a gift and a curse as the years went on. In Amanda's early years, she would face a challenging home life. Jessica and Amanda's father split up when Amanda was only three years old, due in part to his alcoholism. Amanda would get to spend some time with her father, but a tragic event would affect her very deeply and send her on a path similar to her father's. He passed away from an alcohol abuse related heart attack when Amanda was only 13 years old. And very soon, her family saw a change in her. She was acting out and she fell into a bad crowd. She would later get involved in drug use and the drugs and levels of use would seemingly get worse and worse. Drugabusestatistics.org notes that half of all people 12 and older have used illicit drugs at least once. Worth mentioning, they are including marijuana in that number. But another troubling statistic is that 70% of users who try an illegal drug before age 13 develop a substance abuse disorder within the next seven years compared to only 27% of those who try an illegal drug after age 17. By 15 or 16, Amanda was using hard drugs, and she dropped out of Nashua High School South during her sophomore year. Amanda's family tried to get help for her on several occasions, even bringing her to rehab, but the treatment seemed to only work temporarily for her. AmericanAddictionCenters.org notes that less than 42% of individuals who attend treatment for drug and alcohol abuse actually complete those programs. But even the people who do complete those programs face some very strong challenges maintaining their sobriety after they leave. They state that after completing the treatment, it's important to have a game plan to help maintain a new sober lifestyle. 
Individuals need to surround themselves with a support system of family, friends, treatment alumni, and mentors who will encourage and promote healthy lifestyle choices. And what bigger way to try to change your life than becoming a mother? Amanda got pregnant. However, her family was worried that she was also falling away from her sobriety. Amanda would wind up giving up her rights to Madeline when she was born so that her mother, Jessica, could raise her. Amanda would visit Madeline and was working to get solo visitation allowed with her. Jessica states that Amanda was able to see Madeline in an unsupervised capacity for small time windows as much as up to one hour, but it soon seemed that Amanda's lifestyle went back off the rails. Leading up to her disappearance, she had several run-ins with the law, most of the charges related to drugs. She actually had three active court cases at the time that she disappeared and had been at one hearing on Monday, March 16th, and was scheduled for another on the 18th. But on March 17th, Amanda disappeared. Her family wouldn't become aware of this until a few days later, when a friend of Amanda's named Ron put a message out on Facebook saying that he hadn't heard from her and he was becoming concerned. Amanda's aunt, Joan, saw this message and got in touch with Ron. Now, I know many of you are keeping track of everyone we mentioned to evaluate if they could be part of her disappearance. I encourage you to listen to the Vanished episode to hear from Ron directly. While I do have some questions about the relationship he may have been having with Amanda, I feel that his cooperation, both with the family and the podcast, as well as the helpfulness and information he's provided in terms of her disappearance, speaks for itself. Ron told Aunt Joan that he was trying to get in touch with Amanda since March 17th and that he hadn't heard back from her, which was very uncommon. He was also contacted by people that were in an apartment with Amanda on the night she disappeared, and they contacted him using her phone. The family wonders how they would have known her password. Obviously a good question, but more importantly, who were these people? The family has learned that the man who rents the apartment, a man named Daniel, was there with Amanda and another couple. There is some question if Daniel may have been a client of Amanda's or if they had some other connection. The other couple was a man named Mike and a woman thought to be his girlfriend. Their story is that they partied into the night, they all went to sleep, and when they woke up, Amanda was simply gone, but she had left all her stuff behind. This apartment is located on a home on Birch Street, an area that's a mix of homes and businesses and does feature some small sections of brush and tree lines. I was hopeful that with some businesses interspersed in this neighborhood that maybe we'd hear that authorities were able to track something down in that area using security cameras or even doorbell cameras, but Amanda didn't have her own car. What exactly would we be asking the people reviewing the footage to look for outside of someone walking down the street that might look like Amanda? Assuming the possibility that something happened to Amanda, I'd personally be very interested in checking that section of land between the homes and the golf course. Of course, at this point, Amanda's family didn't even know that she was missing, but thankfully, Ron does get in touch with them, and a few days after she was last seen, a missing persons report was filed. The NamUs profile states that Amanda T. Grzewski is a white Caucasian female who went missing from Derry, New Hampshire at the age of 23, and she would now be 26 years old. She stands at five feet, five inches tall and weighs around 135 pounds. The circumstances of disappearance state that Amanda was staying with a friend on Birch Street and reportedly left early in the morning without her purse, cell phone, or other belongings. She has been known to frequent Nashua, Salem, Manchester, and Hooksett, according to authorities. She has brown hair and hazel eyes and a number of tattoos including large butterflies down the side of her right hip, a small heart under her left breast, and a tattoo on the back of her neck that is an open peace sign with an abstract tree. I've also seen another pair of tattoos on her profile over at missingpersoncenter.org, and those are two red bows on her hip line. However, this photo doesn't show her face. I can't be 100% sure if this is accurate. I'm not seeing any mention of these tattoos anywhere else, so I just want to put that out with a little bit of a grain of salt. 
Nine days after she went missing, the Derry Police Department announced that Amanda was indeed missing, and they issued a press release that got a small amount of attention from local publications. They reissued the press release several more times, trying to shake out some more leads, again on April 8th, May 5th, and July 17th. They just weren't getting the information they needed to help bring Amanda home. The initial investigator assigned to the case would retire from the force, and Amanda's case was handed off. Of course, around all this, we're all learning how to live in a worldwide pandemic. Mandatory stay-at-home orders went into effect less than two weeks after Amanda's disappearance, meaning even if people knew her face from the media, the chances of someone spotting her out in the wild were severely impacted. Thankfully, ManchesterInclink.com saw that there was much more to this important story, and that's even with information confirming that Amanda was living a lifestyle of drug abuse and prostitution. They stepped up and wrote an in-depth piece interviewing several people, including Amanda's mother, Jessica. She said, quote, I totally feel like there was foul play in my eyes or something happened and someone did away with her. It's totally not her. She would have called. She also noted that when Amanda was actively using fentanyl and communication with her family would become limited, she still had never gone for more than a week without contacting someone. Captain Vernon Thomas, the man that we saw at the start of today's video, told the publication that Amanda was virtually homeless at the time of her disappearance. And in mid-March, she was forced to vacate a hotel in Nashua and had brought her two backpacks of clothes, her purse, and her phone to that friend's apartment on Birch Street. I also found out in other sources, she also had a laptop with her, and the location of that laptop is completely unknown. Ron also says that there's a neighbor close to the apartment that said they had heard a scream that night, someone screaming for help. Captain Thomas thinks that Amanda's cell phone holds another important clue. She was texting with someone about moving to nearby Salem. He said, quote, We don't know what her destination was in Salem, but we were thinking she was going to stay there instead of Derry. Her messages were brief. Having her cell phone, you'd think that this mystery person would be easy to track down. However, Amanda only saved her contacts with first names or sometimes just nicknames. When police tried tracing the actual phone number itself, it led to a prepaid burner phone. And those woods that I was concerned about that are behind the neighborhood, well, Derry police also became concerned. They had canine units out there on three occasions looking for anything. They also did a sweep of the area behind their own police station. I'm not exactly sure why, possibly based off a tip that was called in, or I don't know, maybe they found something out there. Captain Thomas says that law enforcement is actually keeping information about this case pretty restricted because he fears this isn't just a missing persons investigation. Quote, this could very well be a homicide. In another strange twist, an item belonging to Amanda would pop up. Her social security card was found on the ground outside of Elliott Hospital on March 26th, which was the same day that police publicized her disappearance. That's approximately 11 miles away from the apartment she was last seen at and raises a big question. Did she leave with just her laptop and social security card, but left her phone, cash, purse, and clothes behind? Or did someone that had access to her personal items for some reason take that card and then drop it at that location? If so, is it meant to throw off search efforts or divert police resources? Of course, a hospital would surely have security cameras, and Elliott Hospital does, but nothing could be found when reviewing the footage from those cameras to try to determine who dropped the card there or why they might have done that. From this point, the press would start running its annual updates about the case. Her sister, Michelle Fentros, shared more about Amanda in a piece by the Eagle Tribune, saying that Amanda was caring, outgoing, and funny a mother who should be known for much more than her struggles. Quote, she really did care about her daughter and a few times tried to make herself get better. Addiction is terrible and nasty and sometimes it overtakes people. She wanted to do better, at least for her daughter. 
She last saw her sister in a hospital in December of 2019. Amanda was bedbound, being treated for some sort of infection. Michelle had brought Amanda some clothes, and the next day she went back to visit, only to find out that Amanda had checked herself out of the hospital. She also says that Amanda was very possessive of her belongings, making the way that she left so many important items behind in that apartment very hard to understand. On the second anniversary of her disappearance, the Derry Police Department issued another release asking for more help with the case and saying they had logged hundreds of investigative hours, including interviews, area searches, internet and social media examinations, and followed up on numerous tips. But as of that date, they had no substantiated tips or information to Amanda's whereabouts or circumstances under which she disappeared. I've been considering that Amanda had several court cases that were active, and could she have been afraid that she was going to wind up serving a sentence for one of those charges? As a matter of fact, the Hooksit Police Department website notes an active warrant for Amanda was issued on April 1st of 2020 for a drug-related charge. If I was going to run away nowadays, especially running from the law, one of the first things I would think to do would be to ditch my phone. You can buy a prepaid phone just about anywhere, and while I hope there's some chance of this actually being the case, so that Amanda's family may be reunited with her at some point in the future, I also think that she would have likely taken her money with her. She probably would have taken her clothes with her. Her family says her stuff was always important to her. It just seems like there's something else at play here. She was communicating with that unknown person about relocating to Salem. Did they possibly come to pick her up? Again, why would she have left all those important items behind? I'm just not sure that this is a feasible lead, but maybe law enforcement has more information on this than they're telling us. Another common thought in cases of this nature is the possibility that there was an overdose. But Ron made a very good point on the Vanish podcast that I looked into a bit more. New Hampshire's Good Samaritan Law has a specific fact sheet about drug overdoses, which essentially protects the person that would call it in. Quote, New Hampshire's Good Samaritan Law allows people to call 911 without fear of arrest if they are having a drug overdose that requires emergency medical care or if they witness someone overdosing. Of course, the reality of placing that phone call may be a very different thing if you are high yourself or if you have more drugs and paraphernalia in the home. If you are going to try to hide something like this, though, why keep her stuff and then use her phone to contact a friend of hers? It's just a very difficult to understand set of circumstances and events with this case. It's been reported that investigators have explored multiple scenarios themselves. Maybe she was picked up by a car. Maybe she wandered off on foot. Maybe she went out for some fresh air and accidentally got locked out. Of course, there's also the concern that maybe she did go outside and a random person saw a situation that they could take advantage of. Amanda's sister, Michelle, believes that someone knows what happened to her and said, people don't go missing into thin air. At this point, we need answers for closure. She's absolutely right. Someone has to have a piece of this puzzle. And if that person's you, please use the contact information we have in the description box below to call that information in and help this family out. Three years probably feels like an eternity for this family. And for more than half of her life, a little girl has been wondering where her mother is. Law enforcement says they will continue to interview Amanda's acquaintances, including the people that she was last seen with in Derry. Captain Thomas promises that effort will continue until we locate her. He also promises not to let Amanda's case go cold. Quote, we won't let that happen with this investigation and continue to seek the public's help in trying to find her. This year, Boston 25 interviewed Amanda's Aunt Joan. They asked her what it's been like for the past three years, to which she answered, just the unknown, not knowing what to expect. It's really 50-50. Did foul play happen? Was she human trafficked? No one knows. All Aunt Joan does know 
is that she wants Amanda home. Amanda's mother, Jessica, told the Eagle Tribune, I have a strong feeling that foul play was involved. There's always hope, but being her mother, I have a gut instinct that she's gone. And Amanda's daughter, Madeline, is now at least five years old. Her grandmother reports that she's very much like her mother was when she was a child. Madeline is aware that her mom is missing, but grandma also tells her, that she can't give up hope, that they will find her someday. There's an active change.org petition trying to bring the FBI into Amanda's case. Please take a moment to review it and consider adding your own signature. There's a link in the description box down below. If nothing else, it's a great way to let Amanda's family know that many more people out here care about her and them. You can also help by sharing this video with any friends you have in the New Hampshire area. Let's try to keep the awareness raised and get as many eyes, ears, and hearts open out there looking for Amanda Grzewski. A big thank you to PayPal supporters Brandy Fry and Sigrid E. O'Hearn. Since 2015, we've always run limited commercial ads for the benefit of the viewers and the families we're trying to help. Obviously, we can't do that without support. If you'd like to help us out, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Frazzled Cat recently did. We really appreciate your support on our mission to run as few ads as possible and help as many cases as we can. Thank you, NamUs, NBC Boston, Boston.com, Boston 25 News, Manchester Inklink.com, Patch.com, American Addiction Centers.org, Drug Abuse Statistics.org, dhhs.nh.gov, and the disappeared blog for information contributing to today's case. Also, a huge thank you to the Vanished Podcast. And if this case has grabbed at your heart, I highly recommend you check out Marissa's coverage to give you more amazing insights with interviews from the family and others. Also, a big thank you to the Derry Police Department and Captain Thomas for all the hard work they're putting into finding Amanda. Please join us again on Monday for a brand new episode of Case Cracked, where we will go into how recent charges have been filed in the Dylan Rounds case right here on the Lord and Arch channel.